northern France. This was the scene of desperate fighting in World War I. A yawning crater testifies to the power of a single high explosive detonation. A new type of movie camera, light and portable, was pressed into service on this battlefield a century ago. Now its eye was turned to war. A gigantic mine detonation filmed as it happened. For the first time, people far from the war could witness the reality of armed conflict. Britain's Imperial War Museums have an extensive archive of battle footage. The rarest film is held in a special facility on the outskirts of London. These images of war became the world's first full-length war documentary. The Battle of the Somme. Many who thronged the theatres were desperately hoping to see images of sons and husbands. The soldiers' faces reflect fear and tension. Such extraordinary images left home audiences speechless. The Battle of the Somme was filmed by Geoffrey Malins, a British Army cameraman. Malins was committed to bringing the reality of armed conflict to the public. What a record. I had recorded it in my little 7 by 6 inch box, and when this devastating war was over, people would be able to view all over again the fearful shells bursting, killing and maiming. With film archives upgrading their holdings and increased public disclosure, Precious new footage is being discovered. Now, cutting edge digital technology brings humanity's fading memories vividly to life. A hundred years of history. The people, events, and ideas that shaped our world come alive in rare archival footage. This is a century on film. We begin with the First World War, when motion picture cameras came into their own as a tool for documenting history. The Paris Metro was a symbol of vibrant urban culture. At the Universal Exposition, visitors traveled on moving sidewalks. Paris exemplified European peace and prosperity. Coco Chanel's far-reaching impact on fashion was also in train before the war. Chanel's sporty designs overturned the corset-bound conventions of women's fashion and sparked a revolution. In the United States, Orville and Wilbur Wright designed and tested history's first powered aircraft. No one suspected that the advance of technology might not be an unqualified benefit to humanity. June 1914. It begins with an incident in Bosnia-Herzegovina, recently annexed by Austria-Hungary.
The heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne and his wife are assassinated in the Bosnian capital of Sarajevo. The killer is a Serbian nationalist. Gavrilo Princip belongs to an underground group resisting Austrian control of Bosnia-Herzegovina. The Archduke's uncle is the Emperor Franz Joseph I. In retaliation, he declares war on Serbia. Russia has territorial ambitions in the Balkans and proclaims its support for Serbia. Tsar Nicholas II orders his generals to begin mobilizing for war. Before the war, the great powers form interlocking security alliances that split Europe. Britain allies with France and Russia, Germany with Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. One after another, more nations are drawn into the conflict. More than 30 countries will be scorched by the flames of war. Austria's ally, Germany, declares war on Russia and France in August. August 4th. In pursuit of victory over France, the German army invades neutral Belgium. One and a half million Belgians flee their homeland. Belgian ally Britain declares war on Germany. Half a million young men volunteer to serve their country. Memories of bloodshed have dimmed after decades of European peace, and the war is seen as a romantic adventure. The Imperial War Museums hold thousands of recordings of Allied and German soldiers and civilians. In commemoration of the war's centennial, the museum released the first-hand audio testimony of 1,300 people. I was quite certain that we beat the Germans quite easily, as easily as the newspapers said we would. And I was 17, like thousands of other youngsters, we rushed into the army because we had a frightful thought that the war was going to be over by Christmas. And I remember very well the tremendous enthusiasm. All the soldiers were decorated with flowers, bands playing, flags flying. Of course, Germany now would go into war and win it. Many volunteers come from impoverished backgrounds or are unemployed. Most volunteers go into battle after only brief training. Britain's green recruits become fodder for the latest German machine guns. They were laughing and singing and joking, all a lot of them, and in the twinkle of an eye, I was the only one left alive after 400. I was the only one left alive after 400. Trenches answer the threat posed by machine guns. Soldiers shelter in the narrow confines of the trench and await the order to attack. The zone of contact between the British and French against the Germans is known as the Western Front. This aerial footage shows just some of those 700 kilometers of gouged earth. Rain and mud are a constant torment. The trenches are notoriously filthy. Lice and disease are the soldiers' constant companions. 
German soldiers receive vaccinations. The prolonged trench warfare means diseases like typhus and tuberculosis run rampant. Rates of venereal disease explode. This film, produced by the French army, promotes the prevention of sexually transmitted disease. More than 200,000 Allied troops contracted syphilis during the war. Soldiers on leave file eagerly into a military authorized brothel. We went to dances, we went to everything, we drank what we wanted. And, and Did you know, I denied myself nothing, wine and women. And I always say that that put me safe. Within a year, fighting spreads to Europe's colonies and possessions. The war becomes truly global. Fighting rages in Central Asia as well. Russia and the Ottoman Empire struggle to achieve victory. The Ottoman army masses in the Caucasus Mountains in the border region between the Black and the Caspian Seas. In the dead of winter, the Ottomans order 120,000 men to cross a 3,000 meter mountain range. The campaign is doomed from the start. More than 10,000 Ottoman soldiers freeze to death during the march. Russian soldiers bury the dead. The ill-conceived operation costs the Ottomans 90% casualties. After five months of fighting on the Western Front, 1.5 million men are dead. Many corpses lie unburied in the trenches. The passion for adventure that intoxicated the young quickly fades. American writer F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about trench warfare in his fourth and final novel. See that little stream? We could walk to it in two minutes. It took the British a month, a whole empire walking very slowly, dying in front and pushing forward behind leaving the dead like a million bloody rugs. In 1915, a brilliant woman in Berlin takes her own life. Clara Imavar's death is linked to her husband's role in the development of fearsome new weapons of war. Her husband is the scientific genius Fritz Haber. Haber's work in perfecting the process of extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere won him a Nobel Prize. His achievement led to the development of nitrogen-based fertilizers, revolutionizing global agriculture and saving millions from starvation. This rare footage shows Harbour and other laureates preparing for a commemorative photograph at the Nobel Award Ceremony. Harbour gestures with his spectacles from the back row. After the war broke out, Haber applied his genius to a top-secret German research effort. He headed one of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes for Chemistry. Today's world-renowned Max Planck Society traces its roots to the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes. Two of Germany's scientific geniuses, Albert Einstein and Fritz Haber. 
When word of Haber's research reached Einstein, he reacted with shock. You are using your scientific genius to the wrong ends. Haber is secretly researching the production of poison gas. He visits the front to supervise chemical weapons testing personally. On April 22nd, 1915, his invention makes a deadly appearance on the battlefield. 168 tons of chlorine gas are released over seven kilometers of front line. The gas fells many hundreds of totally unprepared enemy soldiers. What happened, these shells, when they burst, it drop all on the floor, liquid. And in the morning, as the mist, there's always a mist there every morning, like, and then they realize what it was. And uh, a lot of the uh, fellows were laying about sick and going blind. The soldiers panic and abandon their positions. Even civilians fall victim to wafting fumes. Crude masks are rushed into production as protection from this lethal new weapon. Stunned by the news, Clara confronts her husband. This is a perversion of science. You must stop your research. But Harbour was unmoved. My gas will bring a quick end to the war and save German lives. In fact, his creation only prolongs the war and ensures more casualties on both sides. The Allies soon develop a powerful answer to the German challenge. By war's end, chemical weapons agents will cause well over a million casualties. On May 1st, 1915, a celebration is held to honor Harbour for his achievement. Later that night, Clara Imava takes up her husband's pistol. Then, she turns the gun on herself. Tragedy would dog harbor for the rest of his life. Zyklon B. This powerful pesticide would later play a notorious role in the Holocaust. Zyklon B was derived from research carried out by Harbour's Institute. Harbour himself was a Jew. He never imagined that his work would play a key role in the Nazis' program of genocide against the Jews. When the Nazis came to power in 1933, Harbour was forced to flee Germany. I am bitter as never before, and the feeling that this is unbearable increases by the day. I was German to an extent that I feel fully only now, and I'm filled with incredible disgust. Chemical agents came to be used in later wars as tools of mass killing. 
they continue to cause immeasurable suffering to this day. Nineteen fifteen. To evade artillery and gas attacks, huge underground dugouts were constructed all along the Western Front. This dugout is ten meters below ground, with four hundred hectares of tunnels. British soldiers prepare a fearful surprise for the Germans. Placing huge mines under enemy lines is a tactic used by both sides. The men carefully position a powerful mixture of aluminium powder and ammonium nitrate. Then... During World War I, the Allies triggered 750 mines over 160 kilometers of front line. And there was a mass of our fellas had been caught by low exploding shrapnel, and they'd been absolutely slaughtered. It was the first time I'd smelt human blood fresh, and it's the most horrible smell I've ever had. I've ever smelt. The pleas of soldiers in the dugout still echo 100 years later. Merciful heart of Jesus. Hell. Some dugouts had their own chapels. Soldiers waiting to charge the enemy lines offered prayers in the darkness before going into battle. The third year of war, the Western Front is locked in place. The battle moves from underground into the skies. The first bombers take to the air. Technology is pushed to the limits, creating new dimensions in killing. A hero emerges from the swirling air battles high above the trenches. Manfred von Richthofen is a German aristocrat. His crimson Fokker triplane earns him the nickname the Red Baron. His plane is equipped with a high-performance machine gun. Richthofen scores 80 aerial victories. His squadron, christened the Flying Circus, strikes fear into the hearts of Allied airmen. Richthofen is renowned for his courage. As a model of chivalry, he is idolized by German women. Kaiser Wilhelm II awards Richthofen the Paula Merit, Germany's highest honor. During the war, half of the pilots who took to the air were killed, often in training accidents. As one after another of his comrades fall, the Red Baron doggedly keeps flying. People in high places have urged me to quit before my luck runs out. 
But I should despise myself if I retire to preserve my life while every poor fellow in the trenches has to stick it out. Finally, in April 1918, 25-year-old Richthofen meets his end. He is shot down behind Allied lines. His enemies bury him with full military honors. The British hit on a new strategy to achieve a breakthrough. In 1916, Britain launches a campaign to destabilize the Ottoman Empire, Germany's ally. This campaign gives birth to the legend of a singular hero. The Ottoman Empire entered World War I through its military alliance with Germany. Kaiser Wilhelm II pays a state visit to the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed V. For over six centuries, the Ottoman Empire controlled a vast territory straddling Europe and Asia. But successive wars have weakened the empire, which is called the sick man in the region. The territories controlled by the Ottoman Empire include most of the modern Middle East. When war breaks out, the empire has a population of 18 million. 70% of the population is Turkish or Arabic, but the rest of the empire's peoples are a diverse mix, including Kurds and Jews. Britain believes it can turn the Arab yearning for independence to its advantage. It decides to support the Arab movement with the aim of toppling the Ottoman Empire from within. The British are also interested in major oil fields discovered in the Arabic-speaking regions of the empire. They initiate clandestine contact with influential Arabs. One target is Sharif Hussein of the Hashemite family. Another, his third son, Emir Faisal. The assignment is given to young intelligence officer Thomas Edward Lawrence. To liberate the Levant from the Ottoman Empire, he arranges British supplies and money for Faisal's Arab revolt. Faisal places great trust in Lawrence, who could speak Arabic and new Arab culture from his archaeological work in the Middle East. Britain's High Commissioner in Egypt promises Sharif Hussein that Britain will recognize Arab independence upon the overthrow of the Ottoman Empire. On this understanding, Hussein and Faisal organize the Arab Revolt. Arab inspiration was our main tool in winning the Eastern War. So I assured them that England kept her word in letter and spirit. In this comfort, they performed their fine things. The insurgents use guerrilla tactics skillfully to harry the Ottoman forces. An American journalist helps make Lawrence a household name around the world. His name is Lowell Thomas.
Thomas meets Lawrence while he is on a mission to make a film promoting American entry into the war. I happen to be lucky enough to accidentally run into Lawrence on one of the narrow streets in Jerusalem one day, and he was wearing Arab costume and a remarkable man. I saw very quickly that he was something really phenomenal. Thomas's multimedia presentation enthralls audiences at London's Royal Opera House. Thomas depicts Lawrence as a desert hero. At the London premiere, Thomas himself takes the microphone to narrate the story of Lawrence's exploits. The show's full title is With Allenby in Palestine and Lawrence in Arabia. He came to the aid of the Arabs. Crushed by the oppressive Ottoman Empire, the Englishman Lawrence. At the side of the Emir Faisal, scion of the great Hashemite dynasty, was the uncrowned prince of Arabia, Lawrence. The exotic images and Thomas's dramatic storytelling are a sensation and Lawrence is quickly catapulted to international fame. Years later, the desert hero will be depicted on film again in an epic production that will become a classic of cinema. But in the eyes of the Arab people, Lawrence symbolized Britain's duplicitous Middle East policy. While the British are promising the Arabs independence, they make a secret deal with France to take land for themselves and divide the rest of the region up into areas of influence with friendly leaders. And without consulting the Palestinians, they also pledge support for a Jewish national home in Palestine. Lawrence was active in British diplomacy in the Middle East and criticized for his alleged complicity. Britain's promises to the Arabs, French and Jews planted the seeds of tragedy in the region. Britain is working to change the geopolitical map in another way. In the United States, a leading banker passionately supports Britain. Under his influence, the neutral United States starts supplying funds to the Allies. This banker is John Pierpont Morgan, who heads Britain's New York agent, J.P. Morgan and Company. With the Secretary of State's influence, Morgan obtains presidential approval for a massive loan to the Allies. Morgan and his partners finance vital Allied purchases of American war material. His company also profits from the Allied procurement. By 1917, British credit is almost exhausted. Fresh German attacks on American ships are their ironic savior. Germany is also undermining its enemy on the Eastern Front. With clandestine support from Germany, a Russian revolutionary leaves Switzerland for his homeland. He is Vladimir Ulyanov. Ulyanov is known to history by the name he takes as a revolutionary, Lenin. Twelve years earlier, he participated in riots against the Russian Tsar. Pursued by the secret police, he escaped to Switzerland. Germany arranges a special train to take Lenin back to Russia. The goal is to encourage unrest and destabilize Russia from within. Poorly led, the Russians suffer a succession of daunting defeats. Weapons and food are running low. A million soldiers desert. 
the Russian army is on the verge of collapse. Give us bread. In Petrograd, women protest rampant food shortages. As army deserters join forces with workers, the situation slides toward revolution. The Romanov line, which has ruled Russia for 300 years, is overthrown by the people. Tsar Nicholas II hides in a church before being captured and confined in Western Siberia. German soldiers deliver Lenin to Petrograd. Lenin organizes the soldiers and overthrows the provisional government in a coup d'etat. The October Revolution marks the birth of the world's first communist state. In this recording, Russia's new leader speaks to the people. Four months earlier, the Bolshevik-led revolutionary government surrenders unconditionally to Germany. Germany's scheme is a brilliant success. A German diplomat profiles the situation for his Kaiser. Only after the Bolsheviks received a steady flow of funds from us were they able to conduct energetic propaganda and extend the limited appeal of their party. Now, with peace in the East, Germany shifts its forces to the Western Front for the decisive battle. After three years of stalemate, the Allies face a crisis. Britain's war spending has ballooned to over six times the nation's peacetime budget. The United States enters the war in April. Washington offers the Allies $1 billion in credit. President Wilson appoints a senior J.P. Morgan executive to manage U.S. Army supplies. June 1917, American troops depart for Europe. By war's end, some two million soldiers will see the face of battle. But for Russia, peace with Germany does not mean an end to the fighting. The nation spirals into civil war. The counter-revolutionary White Army is determined to reverse the Bolshevik takeover. Another of the White Army's targets is Russia's Jewish population. Many politically progressive Jews support the Bolsheviks. As a result, the Jews as a people are suspected of harboring Bolshevist sympathies. This rare footage from 1919 documents the aftermath of a pogrom in Ukraine. Our hearts are filled with deadly vindictiveness and hatred. Our volunteers take pleasure in casual killing for its own sake. No one can seem to stop the slaughter. Since the early 19th century, when it absorbed large areas of Polish territory, Russia has been home to the world's largest population of Jews. 2,000 years after the fall of Jerusalem, Russia's 7 million Jews preserve their religious practices and communities, despite many restrictions on where they can live and work. 
But when social unrest occurs, the Jews are often targets of popular rage precisely because of their isolated status. Unrest during the Russian Revolution is no exception. An estimated 100,000 Jews are massacred during the turmoil. To escape the pogroms, many Jews flee Russia. They and their descendants form large Jewish communities in America and Palestine. After four years of bloodshed, the global struggle now enters its final stage. American money finances the production of 600 tanks and 800 bombers. Now they deliver a devastating blow to the German army. On October 1st, the Allies enter Damascus. By month's end, the Ottoman Empire accepts the terms of an armistice. This footage captures the arrival of Arab insurgents in Damascus. Emir Faisal, the commander of the Arabs, makes a triumphal entry. T.E. Lawrence accompanies the victorious army. Faisal heads the newly established Arab government in Damascus. The climax occurred when Faisal entered the city and appeared as the embodiment of freedom to a people to whom freedom meant not merely an escape, but also a long-drenched fulfillment. Soon after, British General Allenby tells Faisal that Syria will be a French protectorate. I was acting as the interpreter between Allenby and Faisal. When Faisal had gone, I made to Allenby the last request I ever made him for myself, permission to go away. I knew how much I was sorry. In 1920, Syria's Congress declares independence and appoints Faisal king. But France's role there is internationally recognized, and French forces put an end to a short-lived Arab independence. Three years later, after a British-sanctioned plebiscite, Faisal is enthroned king of Iraq. But his dream of a great Arab nation lies in ruins. Another ordeal awaits the Arabs in British-occupied Palestine. After the war, it becomes a British-administered mandate territory. Arabs make up 90% of the population and consider it both home and holy land. But in 1922, the League of Nations respects Britain's Balfour Declaration and recognizes British administration of Palestine in order to facilitate Jewish settlement. Jews from around the world, many fleeing mass pogroms in Russia, head for Palestine, longing for the restoration of Zion. Two decades later, the UN will resolve to divide Palestine into Arab and Jewish nations. Israel will declare its independence the following year. And Israel and its Arab neighbors will go on to fight four wars. November 11, 1918, Germany signs an armistice. The war leaves more than 17 million dead and 20 million wounded.
Triumphant, the victors gather to design the post-war world. President Wilson travels to Paris for peace talks. His aim is to establish a lasting peace and he opposes the imposition of burdensome reparations on the defeated nations. But these idealistic goals are stymied by Britain and France. J.P. Morgan partner Thomas Lamond is a financial advisor to the U.S. delegation at the negotiations preceding the Treaty of Versailles. Lamont helps estimate Germany's capacity to pay war reparations. Reparations imposed on Germany total more than 20 times the nation's peacetime budget. British economist John Maynard Keynes is a conference delegate. He resigns in protest over the massive reparations demands. The president might have sought by the use of the financial power of the United States to have achieved some very considerable successes. But the president was set. He had gathered around him a very able group of businessmen, but they were inexperienced in public affairs and knew with one or two exceptions, as little of Europe as he did. The German people erupt in protest over the terms of the treaty. A political organization fanatically opposed to the Peace of Versailles is founded the same year in Munich. A decorated veteran of the Western Front soon joins the group. His name? is Adolf Hitler. Kaiser Wilhelm is forced to seek refuge in the Netherlands. The former German monarch gathers his own firewood. There has never been such treason by a people against their ruler in the history of the world. God will visit a terrible vengeance on Germany. In January 1924, the father of the Bolshevik Revolution dies. Lenin, the charismatic revolutionary, also fathered the politics of terror. After the Soviet Union's breakup, once secret footage came to light. Lenin had forced labor camps built throughout the country. Tens of thousands of landowners, members of the bourgeoisie, and anti-party activists were sent to camps far and wide. Lenin created a secret police organization which executed more than 200,000 people. T.E. Lawrence, hero of the desert, dies in a motorcycle accident in 1935 at the age of 46. News cameras capture Lawrence's funeral. Burdened with guilt for his part in betraying the Arab cause, Lawrence changed his name and often disappeared from public view after the war. I could see that if we won the war, the promises to the Arabs were dead paper. But the acting had now to be accepted. Any protestation of the truth from me was called modesty, self-depreciation, and charming for men were always fond to believe a romantic tale. The truth was I did not like the self I could see and hear. I was continually and bitterly ashamed. The post-war European landscape is a scene from the Inferno. 
the wasteland stretches as far as the eye can see. The war's end leaves embers smoldering throughout the world. Children play at war. Nurses care for the wounded. Officers give orders to the troops. Firing squads do their deadly work. In the years to come, many of these young people will take up arms in earnest. The peace after World War I will prove to be little more than an extended ceasefire. 21 years later, the world will again be scorched by the flames of hell.